right, let's bring it in. Let's see some Bibles. Hold them high, hold them proud. I don't know if you can do for me what you did for Jacob last week. I should, I should make some sort of bet about it or something. Um, count of three, say word. One, two, three. Word. Word. Open up to John 14 today. John 14, as we turn the pages of Scripture, may we turn the attention of our hearts to the Lord in prayer. So um, get your Bibles open and then pray with me, please. Lord, how precious is your word, how blessed we are to have this. God, you you revealed yourself to us throughout time, and and you made a special record of of who you are for us, and then you came down in the, (laughs) oh man, word made flesh in Christ, so you'd walk with us. And then you took record of that too and supernaturally preserved it for us over centuries of persecution. And right now we get to study this. Lord, please bless this study. And speak through me where I am severely inadequate to talk about so many things that we talk about up here. And I I praise you that that you convict me and you you give me the joy of wrestling with the very things that we all wrestle with together. And so may it not be my words, but may your truth ring and echo in our hearts, in our minds. And may we be blessed today just relying on you. I'll pray for our kids hooting and hollering in the other room. I'm so grateful for them and all the parents bringing their kids here to worship. May, May their lesson be as edifying to the children as I hope this is to us. We pray for our brothers and sisters across the city. God, I think about, I think about our, our brothers in Christ in Calvary up north of town. North of town, I pray you bless them right now. And Discovery Church downtown, that you bless them right now. And all of our other brothers and sisters and all our other gospel-centered churches in town, that you would just bless them as they're doing the same thing at this very time, worshiping you through the study of your word. Help us, Lord. Unite us in the gospel and send us out to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Hope you guys are ready. <laughs> Hope you guys are ready. We're, we're starting a series today, two-week mini-series called Supernatural. Um, and, and, you know, the reality is, is, is your existence is far more spiritual and perhaps supernatural uh, than maybe you give it credit for. Just think about this. Your your very salvation was a supernatural phenomenon that was participated in by the Holy Spirit working in your life. Scripture says you were knit together in your mother's womb. Your 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 existence, God God made a soul and put a soul in you. You you were you were specifically born in a specific place period of time, an era in history for a specific purpose that God ordained and created you for. Are you with me, family? You, you're, you're much more supernatural and spiritual, perhaps, than you realize. And so for the next two weeks, we're going to talk about this, and it's kind of the prequel for what comes after that. Um, we need the Spirit of God to guide us as we navigate controversial issues, because you were made for a spiritual purpose. To impact a world that's both natural with spiritual people in it, and, and you and I have to navigate the controversies of society with a focus on what the Spirit would have you do rather than what you would have you do. Are you with me, family? So the next two weeks, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to do about six weeks with a couple guest speakers in there talking about the controversies, and, and I want to inv- encourage you, um, as we go to two services and start a controversy series in two weeks, Start inviting your friends, because these are conversations we should have with your friends who, who are far from God and close to God, right? We're going to talk about abortion. 
We're going to talk about homosexuality. We're going to talk about transgender. We're going to talk about politics. We're going to talk, can Christians be scientific? Are we opposed to, to academia or can we coexist? We're going to have a whole sermon on that. And then we're going we're gonna to tail, on the tail end of that, we're going to go back to the supernatural and we're going to talk about spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues, and supernatural phenomena at the end of this next series. And so I hope you guys are ready. Start praying. Pray like crazy for your leadership. Um, and bring your friends because we need to have these conversations rather than avoid them. Amen, family? Amen. Today, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. The next two weeks are kind of borrowed content. We do that a couple times throughout the year. Um, so very little original content, but really good stuff these next two weeks. And then the, the, the rest of it's going to be mostly just, just Restore Church is going to show up and give you some stuff. Okay, but, but uh, Holy Spirit today, um, Holy Spirit is mentioned, guess how many times? About 800 times in the Bible. 800 times. And, and where's the first place you see the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Verse 2 of what book? The whole Bible. Verse 2 of the whole, whole, whole Bible. Genesis 1, verse 2 says what? The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the what? Spirit. Someone say spirit. Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay? And there, the word spirit in the Old Testament was uh, ruaka, I'm so bad with languages, but ruaka, and it literally means, this is so beautiful, okay, it, ruaka means uh, breath, breath, a breath of air or a gust of wind, and not, not a normal breath, it means like an exasperate, a powerful breath, <sighs> right? The word for spirit in Hebrew means breath, and what's so special about that is the spirit of God appears in what? Power. So it's not some winky, di wimpy, dying breath. It's a powerful breath. What's even more beautiful about that is the word for spirit means breath. Well, think about creation. God did what? He spoke the universe into existence. And the spirit <clears throat> is referenced as a powerful breath. Old Testament. Then you have New Testament word is uh, pneuma, which also means in Greek, wind, air, powerful breath, powerful breath. And and you see the Spirit all throughout Scripture, 800 times, right? 800 times. And in the Old Testament, you actually see the Spirit descend upon people. Descend upon people. But in the Old Testament, he would also depart from people. So King Saul had what? He had the Spirit descend upon him, and he, he messed up, he betrayed God, and so the Spirit departed from him. King David, when he sinned against God with Beth Bathsheba, what did, he, what did he say to God? He said, God, please do not let your spirit depart from me. Okay, and then the New Testament, Jesus shook things up a little bit, right? Um, you see that in Christ, he sent the Holy Spirit for those who are in Christ. And for those in Christ, the Holy Spirit will never leave or forsake you. And as Brother Jacob just crushed it up here last week talking about, you become a temple of God's spirit in Christ. Those of you in Christ right now, the Spirit of God dwells within you, right? And I'm bombarding you with this information for, for this reason, okay? Um, God is so abundantly clear that he, he expects you and me to live a Spirit-filled, Spirit-empowered, Spirit-guided life. He's abundantly clear. Can I show you how clear he is? Are you guys ready for this? If you... If you had just, if you had never seen or heard or, re or read a Bible, if you didn't even know what a Bible was, and you're walking along the Odd Brokaw Trail, and you just happen to see this book laying on the sidewalk, and you picked it up, and you read it without anybody's external influence on your theology, and you read it from front to back, here's what would happen. You would have a radically supernatural outlook on the world around you, right? You would have, you would have immensely high expectations of spiritual and supernatural actions in your life and relationship with Jesus, right? If, if you just read this without anybody telling you, like, hey, hey, back up, you, you need to stop being so spiritual. You, you'd be immensely spiritual if you just read the Bible without anybody telling you to be afraid of being spiritual, right? Uh, you, you absolutely would. He is so clear that he wants you and me, he wants us to have a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-guided life. He's abundantly clear. We're going to jump into John 14 in a minute, but, but what, what I want to point out is, without, without anybody, you know, this is between you and God right now, but how many of us would just say that actually, 
I live a very spiritless life. I'm not saying the Spirit's not in you, but spiritually speaking, your life kind of lacks guidance and directions and, and acknowledging the presence of the Holy Spirit. Maybe many of us. Why? We're going to end to John 14 in a minute, so get ready. Okay? Why is that? Well, perhaps if you're like me, many of your first encounters with a spiritual Christianity, right? Everything has a pendulum effect, right? One side or the other. And maybe if you're like me, your first encounters with what, uh, maybe a spiritual Christianity was, was maybe hyper, maybe, maybe we over-spiritualized things, right? There, there's, you know, maybe you met some people where like, if I was preaching right now and I accidentally dropped my Bible, you would just say, oh my gosh, the Lord's telling us that pastor's a heretic today. Everybody run, right? I mean, there's some people who would just go that, that far and we over spiritualize, right? I mean, I'm t this happened to me the other day. I'm, I moved, we turned my office into that kid's room. We're going to have sound barriers up there next week. If, if it's a little loud next week, but it'll be done. And there's like a million square feet of sound panels. So they're pretty much going to be in like a, an asylum, you know, just padded walls. Okay. It'll be next, next week. It'll be great if it's a little loud today. Um, but thank God for noisy kids in church because I'd rather a church bursting at the seams with noisy children and crying baby. Oh my gosh, crying babies than a church without them, right? Amen, family? But um, I lost my... Oh yeah, so wait, we, we, I got evicted. We, we, they took my office from me and turned it into a kid's room. And so I moved my office across town, actually just up the street. And I'm carrying a stack of Bibles and like all the Bibles fell. And some people would be like, I bind you Bible smashing demon in the name of Jesus. But no, my, my Bibles just fell because there's also a natural order to the world that God designed where gravity exists. And if you're a knucklehead and you're trying to, you know, double carry two stacks of books, books fall, right? And so some of us maybe had this like hyper spiritual encounter that, that made you fearful on the other side of the pendulum that, that I can't be spiritual I can't be spirit-oriented because then I'm going to be weird. Like, are they going to come and make snakes bite me to test if I've got the spirit? You know, like, like and, and you're like, I don't want to, I don't want to go, I don't want to be one of those. And so now you've been fear, you've been, you've been um, fearful and unable to let yourself, like, just say, hey, Holy Spirit, do your thing. Are you with me, family? Are, are, we, are we getting there? Are we getting there? Okay. But what, and that's what I would say is the most common. I don't, I, honestly, I don't think there's a lot of us that go too far in the spiritual. I think the, the majority of us, we have a gross underemphasis of the Holy Spirit, right? A gross over, underemphasis, okay? And so, so some of us, when, when, we, when we spell out our theological position, right, what, here's what some of us would say. We, like, we have God the Father. This is how we describe the Trinity. We have God the Father. We have God the Son. And then the Holy Spirit's kind of like Cousin Eddie. You don't talk about him, and when he shows up at Christmas, you're like, things are going to get crazy, right? And, and you know, like, and we'll just stop right there. But that's, that's kind of how some of us spell out our theological position on the Holy Spirit. Am, am, I, am I connecting with some of you today? Amen? Uh, and so that's what we do. And so what I would like to do is just ask God. In fact, just we're going to literally look at the words of Christ when he says some things about the Holy Spirit and let that be kind of the platform for what we're going to talk about for the next few weeks, okay? So, um, John chapter 14, please, let's stand in honor of God's word. 14, 16 through 20. And he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you for how long, family? Forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me. And what's that last word? And I in you. As you have your seats, I, I just want to point out, John 14 is incredible. Um, everybody's bulletin has a, has a two-week Holy Spirit reading plan. You should all be in your reading plans, but you should add John 14 to your reading plan because it's dynamite. You just read John 14. Uh, it's basically less than a chapter a day for the next two weeks. Can you guys do that? Absolutely you can. 
okay? But there, there's, some, there's some awesome things happening in this conversation. We're going to hyper-focus on th- these verses. But what's Jesus doing? He's comforting his disciples, right? And, and I want you to think about yourself as a disciple in this situation, right? He's comforting his what? Everyone say disciple. He's comforting, everyone say me. He's comforting his disciples. And here's what he's saying to them. He's, he's saying, listen, John 14 is so good. Up in the, like, verse 2, he's like, I'm going to go away. And that's the build a mansion in heaven verse that's just so exciting. Can, I just can't wait to go to heaven. And Jesus, like, I don't know, he pulls, like, you guys see the show where they, like, pull away the, the two boards and they show you the house that's behind? I just can't wait for that. Um, and, and he's just, he, it's, it's right there, right? Um, you got to look at the context, okay? Um, <laughs> But he, he's comforting them. He's saying, I'm going to go away. I'm preparing a place for you. But, but when I leave, he's comforting them. There's going to be a helper. I, and I love that word. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send you a caretaker. You're not alone. There's going to be a caretaker. I'm going to help you. Okay? He wants them to be empowered by the help of the great helper, the Holy Spirit. God desires for you and for me to be empowered by the Holy Spirit's help. So, so let's talk about that, okay? So first of all, the Holy Spirit's not an it. The Holy Spirit, what does Jesus say? He. He's a person in the Trinity. Not three gods, one God in three persons. He's literally God in spirit form. And, and when you read about the Holy Spirit, he's personified, right? You see in Scripture that you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You see the Holy Spirit walks beside you in love. He's personified, right? You see the Holy Spirit, what does he do for you? He intercedes. He cares for you, what? On your behalf. He's a caretaker. He's personified. He loves you. He cares for you. Okay? He loves you. The Greek word is uh, for the Greek word for counselor is parakletos. Okay, parakletos. It comes from two words: para, which means come alongside. So paralegal, para teacher, para professional, para you know para church. It's a, not a church, but it walks beside the church, right? And then kaleo, which is called. So he's he's called beside you, or or within you. Right? And, and so, who is the Holy Spirit? He is what? He is the one who intercedes and prays for us. Are you with me, family? He's right there. What does that do? So, remember last week, what did we talk about? The curtain and the temple was torn, giving humanity access to the presence of God. But beyond that, like, we're not praying to God. You know, we're not praying across time and space to heaven when we talk to God. He's right here with us and among us. You and I don't have to pray for the Holy Spirit to show up. He's here. What we need to pray is that he enables us to open up and, and see that which he's already doing. Amen, family? We need to invite him to be, to just, to, and honestly, I, I love how Brother Abe says it sometimes, like, show off, God. And just invite God to show off a little bit because you want God to show off in your life. I'm just telling you, you do. Invite him, okay? Now, now here, this is, so if you, a lot of you know everything I'm talking about inside and out so far. A lot of you guys, you guys just, you, you got this down. This next part, I think, though, might change your life a little bit. I hope, I hope everybody just gets at least a little something more from today. Um, here, here's what might change some of your lives in terms of your, your thoughtfulness on walking beside the Holy Spirit as he walks beside you. Here's what I think could be uh, revolutionary. I think if you and I were to choose between Jesus Christ in the flesh or the Holy Spirit indwelling, right? And, and we don't have to make that choice. I mean, we have one God who exists in three persons who we, we do life with, right? But if we were to think about choosing, many of us, I'm guessing, would probably pick Jesus in the flesh, because Jesus in the flesh is cool. Like, we're hanging out, and I get a headache, and I'm like, Jesus, my head hurts. And he's like, whammy, and my, my migraine is gone, right? I, I, I mean, you know, I mean, funerals would be interesting. I'm just saying, you know, Jesus is, what do you think? I mean, it, funerals would be interesting. Just have Jesus in the flesh walk with you, right? 
Or, um, you know, I have a barbecue with my neighbors the other day, and by God's grace, they didn't eat all the steak I cooked for them. There's a steak left in my fridge, and I don't know how that happened, because they were so good. Uh, there shouldn't have been any left, but I forgot to get the rest of the groceries, because I was so focused on the steak, and I'm, I'm hungry, and there's no food left. And then I look in my fridge, and I'm like, Jesus, what do you think? Whammy, I better invite everybody over for another barbecue. You know what I mean? I just, and we're never going to go hungry again. Jesus in the flesh sounds pretty neat, right? As long as he, you know, I mean, I see Jesus do some cool stuff in here. And I'm just saying, you, you know what I mean? We, we would say Jesus in the flesh, perhaps. But what's, what's astounding is what Jesus says in a couple of chapters later, in John 16, 7, he says, it's better for you if I go away, because if I go away, the helper will come, because I will send him, because if I don't go, I won't send him, and he won't come. Jesus is saying that it's better for you to have the Spirit in his in his quote-unquote, absence. I mean, Christ is with us, but in his absence. Are you with me, family? Right there, John 16, 7. That's why you're all going to read John this week, okay? He wants them, he wants you, he wants me to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. God desires us to be empowered by the Spirit's help. But he, can, can, are, are you guys ready? Can we just, you know, we're going to do some toe-stepping. Are we ready, fellas? Are we ready, ladies? Okay, so, so here, here's the reality. When we look at the Christians around us, so often what do we see? We see believers in Jesus, but people whose life looks no different than the rest of the world. Right? So we're still bound in the prison to the same sins as other people. You see Christians who prayer, whose prayer lives are flatlined. By the way, you guys, want, you guys want to experience something spiritual and supernatural? Come to our Friday noon hour prayer group. That group gets nuts, and I love it. I mean, I love it. We, we like, we like, we just, it's like a supernatural experience being in our prayer group, and we, we prostrate ourselves before the Lord, and it's, it's incredible, and, and it's one of the best things of my, in my life. I just love our Friday prayer group. Come check it out, and, but, but you'll see Christians with a flatlining prayer life. We, we see among ourselves people who are afraid and struggled and gripped by fear and worried by anxiety. Can we push that a little bit farther? Are you guys ready? Can we, can we take this? Are we ready? We, some of us, we believe in Jesus, but our lives have no real power. Why? Because though the Spirit dwells within us, many of us are living a spiritless life. Let's change that. God wants you, and he wants me, to be spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-led, spirit-equipped in a life of victory to please God the Father. Don't take my word for it. Pick it up and read it as if, no, as, as if it was your first time. and never no, Read this like nobody ever told you anything about it. That's what you'll see. So why? Here's the question, why, right? Well, there's, I think we're going to talk about two reasons why this happens in our lives. Because if you know why, what can you do? You can stomp it out, right? You can, we can work on it together. So, so the first reason, why, why do some of us live this spiritless life? The first one is some of us just aren't aware of the Holy Spirit, right? You, 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 here's what's crazy. I just heard this the other day. About 60% of born-again Christians today believe that the Holy Spirit is a metaphorical um, metaphor for the power of God, not a person in the Trinity. 60%. He's figurative and not a person in the Trinity, right? That's, 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 that's scary. That, that means 60% of Christians aren't even true Trinitarians in their theological orthodoxy. Think about that. Let, let's not... Let, so that means that cut the middle row in half. No, cut the, cut the middle row, I don't know. Actually, no. This much of us statistically right here maybe don't believe in the Spirit. No, I don't want to pick on these guys. This 60%, okay? You guys are toast either way. 
<laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking, right? But, but that's, that's something we need to talk about, right? And honestly, this is quite controversial in theological circles today. So that's why we're, we're kind of just rolling this conversation out. And, and this happened even in Scripture, right? So Acts 19, verses 1 through 3, it's really interesting. Uh, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. And then he found some disciples who were believers in Jesus. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And these people, were, they weren't at Pentecost when the Spirit came. They were baptized by John. And you, you read this. And, but he said, did you receive the Spirit? And they said, no, we never even heard there was a Holy Spirit. We heard there was a Jesus, we knew there was a John the Baptist, but who's this Holy Spirit you speak of? Okay? Some of us, we just don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. And, and some of you, maybe you're in a you're similar situation. You're like, well, I heard about him, but now what? He's there, cool, now what? Right? Um, it's it's kind of like this. I'm a, you don't know until we talk about it, right? I'm part of a travel rewards program. And um, I found out through my travel rewards program that some hotel, and I leveled up last year. Mm, I went from gold to platinum, baby, I'm just telling you, okay? And here's what I found out. <clears throat> well, first of all, you know when you go to a hotel and you're really thirsty and you're dying of dehydration from travel and you go to get a bottle of water and you pick it up and it says, if you drink this, we're gonna charge you $5 and you're like, I'm just gonna die of dehydration and you just, you just make that, so you guys know what I'm talking about? Well, in this travel rewards program, when you show up and check in, they give you the $5 bottle of water at the counter, okay? I mean, here's, here's what they do, okay? Um, when the rooms are sold out, they keep a special room set aside just for me, okay? They, they keep, for their platinum members, they have certain rooms that they just leave empty. If you want to buy the platinum room, you can't have it. It's reserved for me, okay? Um, <laughs> I recently went to a hotel where uh, there's, there, when you go to the elevator, um, what you, they do is they give you this little flashlight, you shine it on there, it shows a secret key, and then you put your room card in there, you hit the button, and there's a special floor with a special, I'm making this up, you guys are like, no, 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 but there's actually a special lounge that you can't get unless you have the platinum key, and you know what happens if you go in the lounge with the platinum key? They have a bar in there. I don't care about the bar, it's not a bar bar, it's a wing bar. Every day they put fresh barbecue wings in there for me, I'm just telling you, um, it's, it's next level stuff. Okay, um, he, here's what I'm telling you. Uh, it's there. It's just there waiting to be utilized. Some of us were just not utilizing it. Are you with me, family? The Holy Spirit, he's just right there as your helper. And you guys are in the platinum group because you've got the Holy Spirit within you. Are you with me, family? And it's just right there, just right for you to be utilizing. Okay, partnering with him, having him be your counselor. He's just right there waiting. Some people aren't even aware of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and just if you sign up for my hotel program, I get points. Just, I'm just, you know, I'm just joking. But it's right there. He's right there, okay? Christians all over the world are going through life without the power of the Holy Spirit. Not because they don't have access to him, but because they're not walking with him. Okay? And then on the other side, there's, there's this spiritual power from God working in your life. It's unlike, it's, un, it's, I don't have the words for it. So many people are living a spiritless life because they are unaware. But the second thing, for those of you taking notes, is this, is some are just resisting the power of the Holy Spirit. That might be many of you. He's prompted you. He's tugged at your heart. He's spoken to you. He's convicted you through Scripture. And you are just resisting Him. Right? Some of you, some of you, you're about to do something wrong and he's tugging on your heart and you're like, no, I want to do it anyways. And every time you participate in whatever that sin is, he's like, please, don't do this. I'm trying to help you. Don't, it's not good for you. Stop it. Don't do this. And you're like, no, I'm going to do it anyways. Right? Some of us, he's convicting us right now not to do things which we know we shouldn't do. And then some of us, he's going the other way, right? He's prompting you to do something good, to give or to bless somebody. And you're like... I'd rather not. That'd be a little inconvenient, right? He, he's prompting you right now. Hey, bless, give, bless, give, serve, provide, do this, do that. And you're like, mm, maybe not. Maybe not, Jesus. That's kind of inconvenient. Maybe not, Holy Spirit. And so some of us, he's, we're, we're resisting him on both sides of the spectrum simultaneously. Hey, don't do that, and please do this instead. No, maybe not. Maybe not. It's, that sounds like work, right? Holy Spirit, do you want me to work, or do you want to help me do the work for you? You know what I mean? Like, just back off. 
Stephen, uh, in the New Testament, read Acts 7 as well, um, as he, right as he's about to die, he's just, he's just whooping on the religious leaders, just speaking truth to them, and they're going to stone him. But what does he say right before that? He says to them, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. Man, that's a big one. Whew. I'm not saying that to you today. But if the Holy Spirit says that to you, then you better, I'm just, okay, I'm just joking. He says, he says, you're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And some of you maybe say, well, well, I don't know if the Holy Spirit really prompts me or moves me or speaks to me. I don't know. Maybe you've just resisted him so much for so long that you're not, your heart is hardened to him. So, so maybe you say, Pastor Jeff, how, how do you know if it's the Holy Spirit or if it's just your own thoughts? Is that a valid question? Are you guys with me today? Are, are, are you guys are just like super, like this is the chillest we've ever been. Maybe it's a Holy Spirit thing, okay? Uh, amen, family? Are we, are we, are we ta- talking about some good stuff today? Um, is it, we're concentrating, I love it, I love it. Um, I lose my con- concentration if you're too quiet. Um, So, valid question. How do I know if it's the Holy Spirit prompting me, right? I just assume if it's something good, it's God. here's, here's, Here's really why. This is really deeply theological. Naturally, I'm really selfish and sometimes crabby. Can I just throw it out there? Naturally, I'm selfish, and when things, oh, when things interrupt my selfish desires, I get crabby about it. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just being honest. Maybe, maybe you don't have that problem, but me, I, I do. And so if I'm led to do something that's going to bless others, I just assume it's the Holy Spirit. Okay? And, and if it's not, what's the worst thing that happened? I did something good. I can still praise God anyways. Right? And, and so if it's a blessing to others, I'm just going to assume that it's the Holy Spirit. Okay? And, and, then, and then even if it's not, I got to minister to somebody. Right? Here, here's a couple of good examples, right? Um, I maybe told you this a few months ago. Um, you know, offering finances, it's not a really a big deal here. Like, we do it because it's worship, but um, I don't know who gives what. I purposely don't know, and we only talk about money like three times a year. Uh, but, and, and if you're, some of you, you're only here when we talk about money, and you're like, man, this church, they never stop talking about money. It was only like three times a year we talked about it, but we should, because Jesus talked about more than anything, and it's a worshipful thing. Anyways, uh, just one random Sunday, it's nice knowing you made budget, though. I'm just saying, you know, um, one day offering was just really bad, and I, it just bothered me. It's just one Sunday. You guys have been so generous this year, and it's just driving me nuts, and I was just like, Jeff, let it go. And so Sunday, it was bad. I couldn't let it go. Monday, I was just like, I'm like mad. I'm like, chill out, dude. Just chill out. It's one Sunday. Just chill out. Tuesday, I couldn't let it go. And so the Lord just, like forced me to my knees in prayer. As I'm praying, I had a friend text me. He said, hey, I've got a gift for the church. And I really thought he was just going to bring me a coffee because he just brings me coffee sometimes and then maybe some groceries. And then uh, he texted me while I was praying. He said, I'm on my way. I have a gift for the church. And he shows up with a pretty sizable check. And here, here's what's amazing. I didn't have to pray about it. God already had him on the way, but he wanted me to pray because the Spirit prompted me to be in tune with what God already had happening, right? Um, I'm just going to assume that's God, right? Um, a few guys and I were out for a pie uh, several months ago, Monday night pie, and, and we were just compelled. You know, we pray for our waiters and waitresses when we're out and about, and I actually felt compelled to shut up, right? I, I know that's, that's shocking sometimes. I just compelled, the Lord just like, the Spirit was just like, Jeff, be quiet. And I was told to be quiet so Kyle could speak up. And he said, hey, can we pray for you tonight? And, and our waitress burst into tears and told us everything going on in her life. And it actually opened a door for us to bless her in a significant way that, that majorly changed the course of her life and fixed some very big problems she was having that we were just happened to be leveraged to take care of at the time. Why? Uh, the Spirit prompted me to shut up and prompted Kyle to speak up, right? And it was just amazing. Um, Man, I got so many of these. Maybe I should, we're going to go over time if I tell you all of them. Um, woo <laughs> I got to start ending on time if we're going to go to two services, <laughs> okay? And the children's ministry team loves it when I go. The, the children's ministry team's always ask me to do like three-hour sermons because they, your kids are so amazing, okay? Um, I'm going to stop that right there because we could have... <laughs> 
you do have amazing kids, and thank you for being here. Um, but so, so one, um, sometimes, we do, sometimes we do borrowed content, sometimes we do replays, and then most of what we do is new content that we, we produce by, I mean, nothing new, we're studying the Bible, but new content. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, maybe several weeks ago, I, I, I was like up all night working on my sermon, and it's like 6, 5 a.m., and the Lord's like, scrap it for today, do a replay. And I was like, I'm arguing with God. I'm like, no, let's not do this. I worked really, this is good. I worked really hard. And he's like, put it away, do the replay. And it uh, just so happened that a uh, dear sister came and told me a story on how she had a guest here that Sunday and uh, s- said it was the best sermon she ever heard and it fixed every issue that she was working on in her life. And why? Because the Holy Spirit was prompting me. And I'm just going to give him credit for that. Are you with me, family? I'm just going to give him credit for that. Okay. But some of us, we're so good at resisting the Spirit. It's kind of like this. You know, my wife just wants to make out all the time. She just never, she just, she just, why are you laughing? <laughs> you know? And, you know, I just resist her for a couple days, and I just say, no. No, just for a couple days. I'm just always telling her no. This might not be a true story. Okay? Uh, who believes me? Okay? But if I'm constantly telling her no, the reality is, is one day she's just going to stop. And the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. And one day, if you continue to resist the Holy Spirit, your heart may become hard, unless you're Jonah. Then I, I, I'm, I would, I'm worried about you, okay? Are, are you with me? He, he's a gentleman. And if he's not treating you in a gentlemanly way, he's going to throw you off the boat. Why do so many of us live a spiritless life? Some of us are not aware, but some of, have, uh, some of us have become so incredibly skilled at resisting the Holy Spirit. Are, are, are you with me, family? Amen? Let's change that. Here's what I want to do. For the next few minutes, I, I want to talk about just three different ways the Spirit can minister to the unhardened hearts. And he can soften the hardened hearts, too, so we're good. Okay, so, so here, the first thing he does is the Holy Spirit can comfort you. He's called the comforter. He's called the counselor. In in chapter 14, verse 16, he says, Jesus says, I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So so this is the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. And, And what amazes me is there are those of us going through difficult things right now, and I can promise you, uh, right now, as as you're just thinking about the Holy Spirit, he's giving you comfort. Right as you think about it, he comforts you. Even though you're hurting, you can sense his comfort. He can comfort you with the peace that what? Goes beyond all what? Human understanding. Right? Oh. So just a few weeks ago, we, we, Dale, we, we laid Brother Dale to rest. Dale Ackley passed away. And I said this at his funeral. Um, the, the notification I got of him passing said what? Dale went to be with the Father. Praise God. How can, a, how can somebody say that when somebody dies? By the peace that comes from the Holy Spirit in the promise of the gospel we believe. Amen? How can we do that? Well, we, only by the power of the comforter. Otherwise, that, that's not a natural response. Without the Holy Spirit, perhaps not. Uh, okay? Um, tr- try this. Just try this, okay? Open your Bible. Not, I mean, open your Bible when you're in a moment of discomfort, but before you read it, and just be in your re- always be in a reading plan of some sort, and, and when you read it, literally, just open your Bible, and then before you read anything, say, say Holy Spirit, please comfort me. And I'm just telling you, never once in my life have I done that and left with discomfort. Never once have I I just turned, I've done lots of times where I've resisted the spirit and he said, go to my word and come to me for for my presence and come to me for my my comfort. And I say no and I walk away and I spend days in misery by my own accord. I've done that lots of times, amen family? But, But never have I opened the word of God and asked for comfort and left in discomfort, ever. Try it, try it, try it. Second thing is the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit can counsel you. He is your counselor, right? Uh, Verse uh, 13, John 16, verse 13, but he, the Spirit of truth, he will guide you in all truth, okay? He, he, He will counsel you. The first time I led somebody to Christ, the first time I got to lead somebody to surrender their life to the Lord, um, you know, I have different ways of explaining the gospel for different situations. You know, you do the way of the master. You do three circles. And there's different ways to articulate the one truth of the gospel. But the first time I ever led somebody to Christ, I'm sitting down with this person I've never met before, and, and she's just, her life's a train wreck. And I was just, just prompted 
to open my Bible and read these verses and say things I've never said before. And I left there being like, man, that sounded pretty good. But I, it was like I was out of control. Like I didn't even have my own words to speak. It was just the prompting of the Holy Spirit leading me to say the words that led her to give her life to Jesus. Okay, man. So there's, there's those of you who are aware of the Spirit's presence and His voice, and you can go through a day knowing the Spirit's with you, and, and he'll be like, oh, hey, reach out to that person. Anybody have that before? Reach out to that person. Hey, pray for that person. And I'm just telling you, like, numerous times, there have been these prompted, counseled phone calls where you call, and somebody's like, hey, thanks for calling. I was just about to kill myself. It happens. Far more often than it should, but it happens. There's this constant awareness of the Spirit guiding you, the Spirit-filled life. And the third thing he'll do is he'll convict you. He'll convict you. John 16, 8, when the Spirit comes, he will what? He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In fact, there's people here today, I haven't even talked about what you're thinking or feeling, and he's convicting you right now. I haven't even said anything remotely close to what he's talking about. But he's convicting you right now. There's others of you right now. You're, you're being, he's convicting you. He's calling you to himself right now. I, I have a friend who uh, one day, one day he, we never met before, and he saw me walking across the street, and he, he's like, I think that guy's a pastor. And just seeing me and thinking about me being a pastor, it prompted him to open his Bible that he never reads and open the Bible he never reads to the Gospel of John and he, or Matthew, and he read the Gospel of Matthew just to the prompting uh, of, of conviction, and he gave his life to Jesus just reading the Gospel of John. Stuff happens. Um, I, we, I have one friend, he literally just drove by the church one day, and he's like, I don't want to go to church. And he, I think he like did two laughs. He's like, I don't want to go to church. He's not a church person. I don't want to go, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And he's like, fine, I'm going to go. And he was just convicted, he came here, and it just changed his life radically. These things happen. These things happen. It's because the Holy Spirit is working. God desires for you and me to have a spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-driven life. Some of us, we've, we've, we've fallen to this pendulum where, where we're, we're afraid because of, of maybe some things that we've seen that are uncomfortable. We're afraid to let ourselves experience that which God's doing. But I would say... If you read your Bible without anybody pressuring you or influencing you, uh, you couldn't read it without a severely supernatural and spiritual outlook on the God you serve. So what I'm going to do right now is we're going we're to just close with a word of prayer. And I'm going to just invite anybody to, uh, you know, just make yourself known however, wherever you go. I think, um, well... Brother Jacob was going to be at the, I think he might be at the back door out there, out in the lobby. And if somebody wants to go and pray, uh, Jacob's going to be right out there in the lobby for you. And I'm going to be right up here just singing my heart out. Interrupt my song and come talk to me. Or you know what? Stay right where you're at. And ask the Holy Spirit to convict you, to counsel you. Something. There's three ways you can respond today. Go, go in back, come in front, or stay where you are. And I'm going to pray, and, and during this last song, I invite you to, to do whatever the Lord, I want to leave it pretty op open-ended, whatever the Holy Spirit prompts you to do. Amen, family? So Holy Spirit, God the Father, Jesus Christ, three persons of the one triune God, we, we celebrate you and we worship you. I pray that you would just just, un, just, just conquer the fears of our heart that prevent us from, from living a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-led life. God, I pray that I just pray that you would just, just provide for us in the ways of comfort and conviction, and all the ways you bless us and provide for us and protect us, and that through that you would just draw us ever closer to you, Lord. May that be what happens during this last song. That it's just, it's just an outpouring of worship. And that people don't, we don't resist your spirit, but we embrace your spirit. By crying out to you, by praying with a brother, 
and whatever you prompt us to do, O Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. And together we said...